Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's session on electronic lodgement of documents, understanding the PEXA system. My name is Irene Horan, and I'm a partner in our property planning and construction team. I will be joined today by my colleague, Julia Yasser, who is an associate in our property planning and construction team. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land on which we are located today and pay our respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. So before we get started, we'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions at any time during the webinar by typing your questions into the box found on the control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll endeavour to answer them during the webinar. You'll also receive a copy of the slides and the recording after the event. We'd also appreciate if you could fill out a short survey on conclusion of the presentation. Now, let's begin, Irene. Today we will be talking all things PEXA and how the use of PEXA has changed the way we work. To date, our firm has completed over 1400 transactions in PEXA. I am the subscriber manager for our firm and I was there at the early stages when the firm first started to implement the PEXA system. PEXA, once a dreaded four letter word, has now revolutionised the way we conduct property settlements as well as lodge land registry instruments. In 2020, as COVID-19 and social distancing rules affected our everyday life, the ability to complete property transactions online from the comfort of our home became essential. Whilst COVID-19 will always be a tragedy, there is no doubt that it has transformed the legal industry and in particular conveyancing as it forced practitioners to come face to face with technology and the uncomfortable paperless environment. There is no longer a need to attend settlements in person, prepare paper forms and struggle through the process of having them signed in wet ink or deal with bank checks, which contained more spelling errors than anyone would care to admit. PEXA has introduced a level of transparency to property transactions that previously did not exist. All parties in the PEXA workspace can now see the progress of financials, documents, and their execution, and each party's readiness for settlement. PEXA checks and verifies documents with the land registry at the time of preparation and before they are lodged for registration, reducing the chance of requisitions being issued after lodgement or errors in the registered documents. Settlements can be scheduled and rescheduled with multiple parties online with the click of a button without the need to spend hours on the phone. Settlement funds, including sale proceeds and stamp duty are transferred electronically as cleared funds into the nominated account immediately on completion. This means that the vendor receives their money immediately and all outstanding rates are also paid without delay. The purchaser's transfer is usually registered on the day of settlement two, which has significantly reduced the previous risk that something might be registered on title between completion and registration of the purchaser's transfer without the purchaser's knowledge and to the detriment of the purchaser. It is no secret that banks often took months to register a purchaser's transfer following completion. With the use of PECSA projects, we can now manage multi-lot property development and complete bulk settlements across multiple workspaces. So you'll see that figure there, 1,454 completed PEXA transactions. That's how many um, approximately Bardia Perry has actually completed to date. So with the electronic preparation and lodgement of documents came unavoidably electronic executions. Temporary measures were introduced at the height of the pandemic in 2020, some of which have since become permanent, much to our pleasure. Electronic transactions are governed amongst others by the Electronic Transactions Act 1999 Commonwealth and the relevant state statutes. statutes. In New South Wales, it's the Electronic Transactions Act 2000, or we'll call it the ETA. An electronic signature is a visible representation of a person's name or mark inserted by a person on a document or in a communication by electronic or electronic and mechanical means 
to identify the person and indicate that they intend to put their mind to adopting the document or communication. A digital signature, in contrast, is concerned with cryptographic authentication technology rather than a person signalling their assent to a document by marking it, such as DocuSign. For an electronic signature to be deemed effective under the ETA, the following requirements must be fulfilled. Identity, the person must use a method to identify themselves and indicate their intention. Reliability, the method of identification must be as reliable and as appropriate considering the purpose of the communication. And consent, the person to whom the signature is given must consent to the use of electronic communication to fulfil the requirement for a signature and to the method of identification. In 2020, special me measures were introduced by the New South Wales Government in response to the COVID pandemic to permit remote witnessing of documents as in-person witnessing of documents became impossible. The pilot scheme pursuant to the Stronger Communities Legislation Amendment, Courts and Civil Act 2020, ran until the end of 2021. The New South Wales Parliament indicated that this would permit enough time in order to evaluate the effectiveness of this scheme and decide whether long-term reform is required. Thankfully, the electronic witnessing provisions remain in force and are set out in Section 14G of the ETA Act. The Corporation's Amendment, Meetings and Documents Bill 2021 became law on 22 February 2022 and enables directors of companies to sign documents electronically. For the first part of the pandemic, this was not actually legally possible, believe it or not, and we had many a conversation about whether we could accept electronic executions from directors of companies. The Australian Registrar's National Electronic Conveyancing um, Council, or ARNIC, was formed for the purposes of coordinating a national approach to the regulation of an electronic environment for completing conveyancing transactions. Given the stakes of electronic conveyancing are so high, the formation of ARNIC was absolutely essential. Practitioners must ensure that they familiarise themselves with ARNIC's model participation rules. Falling foul of these requirements could mean that you actually lose your PEXA privileges. The obligations placed on practitioners are onerous and for good reason. So what general steps should practitioners be taking when making certifications and statements in PEXA? Before making certifications and statements, a practitioner must have a signed client authorization form. This is a prescribed form in Schedule 4 of the Model Participation Rules, and you cannot just adopt your own form. By signing the form, the client authorises you to sign documents in the PEXA workspace on the client's behalf, such as, for example, a transfer, or to lodge documents for registration with New South Wales LRS and do anything else necessary to complete the transaction. Practitioners, you should also be aware that a client authorisation form is not validly signed until it has been signed by you as the representative. If attorneys sign the authorization form on behalf of the client, a practitioner must verify the identity of the attorneys who sign the form. If an agent or authorized delegate is signing on behalf of a client who is not a natural person, you must also satisfy yourself of the authority of that agent. For example, a person signing as a director of a company must show evidence that they are in fact a director, and this, this can be done using a company search. Okay, guys, just to break up uh, Julia and I talking, we're going to do a poll now. Um, so a screen will appear uh, on your screens now with a question. Uh, how many different authorities may be given by a client authority form? Uh, you will have 15 seconds to select your answer from the three options on the screen, being uh, one authority, two, three or more. So please uh, click one of the options on your screen. Uh, we will then let you know what the results are. So it's a tie between one and three or more. And the right answer is three. 
So let's talk about the three different authorities that may be given by a client authorization form. Firstly, standing authority, in which case the expiry date, if there is one, should be included and the conveyancing transaction types covered should be ticked with an additional one listed or detailed in an attachment to the client authorization form. Secondly, a specific authority, in which case the transaction details should be set out in the client authorization form, including the address and the land title reference of the property, and the type of conveyancing transaction covered should be ticked with additional ones listed. For example, if you're lodging a caveat and a transfer in respect of that property on behalf of the client, then caveat and transfer should be ticked. Or thirdly, batch authority, in which case details of the transaction that the batch authority is intended to cover should be set out in an attachment. And this is from the model participation rule number one. So a standing PEXA client authorization form without an expiry date will be valid for two years from the date that it's signed by the client. If the VOI documents expire in that time, so the verification of identity documents expire in that time, you do not need to undertake another VOI. You only need to do this when the PEXA client authorization form expires. Um, and this is in accordance with model participation rules guidance note two, clause 5.6. Even if you obtain a standing authority from a client, it will not authorise you to act in relation to any conveyancing transaction unless it's specifically listed on the form. So for example, for our clients where we do have a standing authorisation, we often prepare um, an annexure which sets out all the conveyancing transactions we intend to act and attach that to the client authorisation form. In 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the face-to-face -face requirements were reviewed by ARNEC and as a result, the client authorisation form doesn't currently need to be wet signed and it's up to you to determine whether the digital execution complies with the ETA um, as discussed above. So Julia just touched on VOI, verification of identity. So you must take reasonable steps to identify your clients. Schedule 8 of the Model Participation Rule contains the verification of identity standard, which sets out what kinds of documents you need to get from the client and how many of those documents you need. The verification can be undertaken by you or it may be provided by an identity agent. When using an agent, you must reasonably believe that the agent is reputable, competent and insured. One reputable agent is Australia Post. It is important to note here that the verification of identity standard does not have to be applied. It is up to the representative to take reasonable steps to identify their client's identity. But the verification of identity standard will always be considered reasonable. So if you are ever in doubt, use this standard. Model Participation Rule 6.5.2 states that a face-to-face -face interview is not mandatory and a practitioner can verify the identity in a way that constitutes reasonable steps. For example, using video technology such as Zoom or Teams. You must also be satisfied that your client has the right to deal. That is, they are a legal person and have the right to enter into the conveyancing transaction. For example, the registered proprietor or incoming proprietor. This requirement is essentially part of verifying the client's identity. Some of you may already be aware that after the 11th of October 2021, the original certificate of title is no longer considered a legal document. You will therefore need to request additional documents from the client, such as rates notices, to establish their right to deal. If you're a client in the webinar today, please be patient with us. Um, we know that we are now requesting more documents and information from you than before, but this is to ensure that we are complying with our PEXA obligations. So Julia just mentioned the 11th of October 2021, which was a very important date for property owners as well as us practitioners. The Register General announced a major step 
in the transition from paper-based registration of land titles in New South Wales. From the 11th of October 2021, changes to the land title system in New South Wales included the following. Cancellation of certificates of title and the control of the right to deal, i.e. the CORD framework, and mandate of 100% of Real Property Act dealings for electronic lodgement through an electronic lodgement network operator, such as PEXA, by a subscriber. These changes have been made under the Real Property Amendment Certificates of Title Act 2021. You should be aware, however, that water access license dealings and certificates remain unaffected under this Act. The Torrens Register is the single source of truth as to an entity's interest in land and always has been. This actually hasn't changed. A certificate of title is merely a point in time picture of the information contained in the Torrens Register at the time the certificate of title is issued. The abolition of certificates of title will not affect ownership of land. The only way to prove ownership of land will now be by obtaining a title search of the property and really that's what people should have been doing before 11th of October as well. From 11 October 2021, all Real Property Act dealings, excluding determination of title boundary, to be lodged with New South Wales LRS can only be done electronically by a subscriber. For example, a lawyer, licensed conveyancer or financial institution through an ELNO such as PEXA. Given certificates of title have been abolished, you will no longer be required or be able to lodge applications for replacements of certificates of title with New South Wales LRS. They don't exist anymore. We're not too sad to see those applications go because they were very time consuming. So the important question is, how do you now lodge dealings online? There are three avenues for lodging a Real Property Act dealing electronically via PEXA. Firstly, as a structured electronic dealing. So by this, we mean the forms that you can create in PEXA and sign on behalf of the client. So these include the more common forms such as leases and transfers. Number two, dealing with exception. Uh, in order to lodge this, you need a lodgement rules exception form filled out and annexed to the dealing that you're lodging. For example, uh, a request form or a transfer including easement. And thirdly, a miscellaneous dealing for which you also need a lodgement rules exception form annexed to the dealing. And this applies to dealings which are not included in the above two and includes a dealing which affects more than 20 titles. In a PEXA workspace, where at least one dealing in a matter is required to be lodged as a dealing with exception, then all the dealings in that matter must be lodged as dealings with exception. For example, if you act for a purchaser and you are lodging a transfer including easement, any discharging mortgagee will need to upload a discharge of mortgage as a dealing with exception rather than creating it as a structured electronic dealing. Uh, and as discussed before, each dealing with exception will require its own lodgement rules exception form. A correctly completed lodgement rules exception form has to accompany each dealing, otherwise you will be requisitioned by the land registry and you will be, um, you will need to pay the requisition fee, which is $50 per requisition. So this slide uh, on your screens now shows you a screenshot of uh, the actual form, the lodgement rules exception form. That's just the first page of each form. And then on the right is the exception list. Uh, both of these documents are available through LRS website. Uh, the exception list uh, is a few pages long. So what you do is you find the number for the uh, accepted dealing that you're lodging, and then you insert that number into the form and you annex the form to your dealings. 
So we have found practically that these changes do make some transactions difficult. Um, in particular, we find when acting for landlords, um, especially government clients, government landlords, a lot of the lessees are unrepresented. So you might know that with transfers, variations and surrenders of lease, both parties now have to be present in the PEXA workspace in order to lodge these documents for registration. Um, and in our experience, this has caused significant delays. Um, lessees are unrepresented and not always quick to involve a solicitor to get this done. Um, second example for practice is a death of a party. So just be aware that the client authorization form uh, ends upon the death of the client, except in South Australia. In South Australia, where a client who has completed a client authorization form dies, an instrument which has been executed pursuant to that client authorization form after the client's death actually remains valid. But in all other jurisdictions, uh, including New South Wales, the death of a client effectively renders the client authorization form invalid. So this means that any instruments or documents, whether signed prior to the death of the client or not, cannot be used and cannot be lodged for registration. Uh, interestingly, we recently had a matter where we acted for a purchaser of a multi-million dollar property and the vendor died the day before settlement, but had already signed the client authority form. Settlement, of course, could not proceed. And after a lot of thought, our client rescinded the contract as he was entitled to do. But if he were in South Australia, he may potentially now be the proud owner of that home. So the abolition of cord holder consent doesn't change the requirement for third parties to provide their consent where required by the Registrar General for the registration of certain dealings. Of course, these consents are not new and have always applied even when cord holder consents existed. The changes just mean that the consenting party is no longer required to be a party in the PEXA workspace and need only provide a written consent which is to be lodged as supporting evidence with the dealing. So examples where consent is required for registration at New South Wales LRS under the Real Property Act are release of a positive covenant, so the consent of any lessee, mortgagee or chargee against whom the positive covenant is enforceable, Transfer releasing easement, the consent of any lessee, mortgagee or chargee against whom the easement is enforceable. The creating instrument may include a third party whose consent is also required to release the easement. And minister's consent is required where Crown land restrictions pursuant to Section 102 Crown Lands Act 1989 are noted on the registrar, register. Where consent is not required for registration, but may be required to bind parties to the terms of the relevant document, for example, a lease may require the consent of the mortgagee if the mortgagee agrees to be bound by the terms of the lease. Okay, so now let's go through any questions that have come in. Please feel free to ask us anything. Um, Julia, one of the questions that's come in is, so can you attend the physical LRS office like we used to back in the good old days and present them with any documents uh, over the counter for lodgement? Uh, I think you spoke about this earlier in the seminar about what, what you can actually lodge in person. So Irene, um, there are exceptions, but they are very rare. Uh, one exception is a plan, so a plan of subdivision, for example, deposited plan. They cannot be lodged in PEXA. They can be lodged electronically by a surveyor, but if the surveyor is not going to be lodging, they can be lodged over the counter at LRS by appointment only. Okay, well, I can't see any more questions, so we'll just give everyone another few minutes in case they come up with anything. Um, obviously, everyone is welcome to send Julia and I an email afterwards. Um, 
with any questions that they may have, if they think of something during the day that we haven't covered today. I think, I think that's it. No questions, but yes, like Irene said, please feel free to email us if you um, do have any questions. And like we said, you will be getting a copy of the PowerPoint and a recording of the webinar. So if you just go to the last slide, Julia, that'll have our contact details on it. Um, otherwise, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today and for your attention. Uh, once you leave today's session, you'll receive a short survey on today's presentation. We would appreciate if you would provide your feedback to us. You will also receive a follow-up email with a link to view a recording of today's webinar along with the slides. On behalf of Badia Perry, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>